Yeah. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's session of Stockbridge Library's online poetry series. Our theme this year is Sparks in the Dark, and we are welcoming poet Guy Reed. Um, before I tell you a little bit about the poet who will be reading with us today, um, I want to thank John Gillespie. Um, John was the president of the Board of Trustees when the pandemic hit, and he had this fantastic idea of bringing poetry into people's homes since they couldn't get out of their homes. And we thought we'd go for a few months, and here we are um, in April of 2024, still going strong with weekly poetry readings. So John, thank you so much. We, we owe a lot to you. Um, and Guy, thank you also for joining us today. Um, a few words about Guy. He won the 2022 Literal Press Poetry Prize and is the author of Second Innocence, The Effort to Hold Light, and the co-author with Cheryl Rice of Until the Words Came. His poems and his essays have been published in journals, both online and in print. And Reed is a graduate of the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Guy, thank you so much for joining us. John, as always, thank you. I will turn the program over to the two of you. Wendy, thank you in the library for hosting our fifth annual poetry month <clears throat> yeah guy once we start we can't stop now this is like a a rock rolling down a hill <laughs> I think, uh perry probably 10 years from now i'll be 85 or something we'll be on show like 2010 and we'll eventually uh yeah a little humor guy to start the program i uh um no no thanks for coming on and um so we always start with you know, what did the theme igniting sparks in the dark mean for you or activate with you? Um, well, first, I just want to thank the Stock uh, Bridge Library and, and you, John, for having us and everyone who's tuned in. And interestingly, it, it kind of sparked the, a bunch of stuff. Uh, in some ways, that's really kind of in my wheelhouse. I mean, the way I interpreted it, well, we already talked a little bit about the eclipse um, yeah. and literally that is celebrating a shadow, you know, uh, uh, people are rushing to be in the shadow of the moon on the earth, you know, the thin slice and um, yeah, how exciting that was, it was you know, it's uh, a way of seeing the light that's there differently in the Corona um, yet the extinguishing of the light for a minute you know um darkness uh i kind of think darkness and light we also have to look at it with without judgment in a way um uh you know dark and light can mean a lot of different things certainly in a spiritual sense in the bible it's the first order of business for god was to let there be light you know and separate it from the darkness uh I think it's important to acknowledge it. I mean, literally, I think I tried to write a poem about this. It didn't quite turn out the way I wanted to, but just in my yard light at night, you know, I like to go out at night. I like to look at the stars. But when you're walking away from the light into the night, you can't see very well, even though you have this bright light at your back. But when you are away, in the darkness facing the light or moving towards it you can see you have a wide expanse of sight yes. so you know um you know and i think of darkness i think of like interior light black holes deep in the ocean uh caves under the covers under the bed in the closet you know so there's there are things that go bump in the night too um but I think hey, it's guy, we only have four hours, so you'll have to. We'll we'll, we'll save All right. the bed stuff for no. It, next it was visit. very rich to think about that, and you yeah. know, you talk about the times in the igniting sparks in the dark. You know, the climate crisis and politics and you know war and uh, all that. I don't address too much of that in my work, but not directly, mainly because I can't do it well. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, think, you know, 
you know, somehow it's a very strange time to be living in. There's some people that just, I don't know, somehow love to be in the darkness, I guess, in terms of divisiveness or war. It just seems like there's some joy in being in the darkness all the time. I don't know. I'm trying to, I'm yeah. trying to figure, I don't know. It's just well, there's something, strange. you know, even when I get in dark moods, you know, yeah. um, you know, I'm searching for something that darkness for darkness sake, I think there's treasures to be found in the dark, but it's about bringing the light in to illuminate. I don't know if, it, you know, some essence or truth, perhaps, I don't know, or maybe that's what the work of creation is, you know, creative practice is, is bringing a light into the dark to try to have some illumination you know yeah. share an illumination you had that might illuminate another great yeah. so just before we before you read some poems just tell us a little bit about your creative process a lot of people have a discipline they want to write every day some other people write when there's some kind of activation you know whether an emotion or an event i'm just just to give us the audience just kind of how do you how do you engage the creative process i think originally it was some i couldn't make music music to me is kind of what you know i don't know top of it but poetry and writing um any creative practice any <laughs> practice you know craft um for me it was about trying to express the inexpressible this is like well how do i how am i closer to god or knowing what everything is seemed to me to uh be through a creative practice i journal a lot um which is a weird word i hate even saying it but uh, you know s seems more fitting than a diary <laughs> and it'll be a lot of boring stuff what i dreamt, yeah. what the weather's like what i did yesterday what i didn't do uh, what happened a year ago this day? And then a poem will s spill out, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'll type that up. I'll go, oh, that's something. And I'll put it, you know, make a document mm -hmm. and work on it. The rest is, you know, just kind of there. And I've done that for, I, well, pointedly trying to make good poems, you know, probably 25 years now, 20. Wow. Yeah, 20 to 25. <clears throat> I've gotten gotten closer through practice maybe those ten thousand hours spread out over a there lot of mornings <laughs> and <laughs> sitting on the stoop you know that's where yeah. and then having being a parent raising kids and you know having a house and a job and a, a partner that takes up a lot of time so poetry fit well into that because it was short <laughs> So I saw Amanda writing down. She's probably, Amanda's done 7,000 hours. So she's trying to figure out how she's going to get to 10. A little, <laughs> little, uh, little humor. Oh, that's going, great. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, share some of your work with us. Sure, sure. Please. <clears throat> um, I picked out a lot of pieces. Um, uh, kind of separated them, thinking light, dark old and new um i really didn't really come up with an order within that but i'll bounce around a bit i guess this first one this one is older it's in the darkness column um it, two of the pieces i'm going to read today are a little bit longer um most are pretty short this is one of the longer ones it uh it has an epigram, a quote of, by Mark Rothko. A painting is not a picture of an experience. It is an experience. Number 16, red, brown, and black, 1958. Nearly 10 feet by nearly nine on the wall, it comes at me like a night terror. Three rectangular, disembodied, blurred, stacked horizontal bands of color. Dark red brown and black pulsating inside an enormous purple stain. I yield 
not my body that shrinks from its advance. Inside the corridors of my flesh, a body of light turns to its side, raises an arm for shield, and hunches on its knees before the propelled vision. It's just a painting on a white wall, lights of the gallery set low. I have seen other Rothko paintings, but this one grows to engulf my soul. Yes, soul is the word I mean. I've doubted its existence, having no proof other than vague sensations in the solar plexus and this consciousness, which may only be the mind. This painting calls out my soul. Fuck. Foreboding, heavy in my chest, makes it difficult to catch my breath. This threatens me. Not abstract. This is palpable. A plum hum of nightfall, earth's shadow, circling the globe, always on the hunt for light. To devour safety in what can be seen is the onslaught of blindness under a moonless night. Shadows grow thick, swallow luminosity from streets and yards of even the most cheerful neighborhoods. Silence, dense in unlit alleys. This is the ancient feeling that beyond the cave mouth fire, the darkness will eat me. My scream does not have the force to escape the black. Thankfully, a bright winter day when I stagger from the building. I survive, braided and possibly damaged. The image continues to expand into the interior of my geometry. Nightfall fills the cracks, allows nothing to escape. Lock the door, flip the electric switch, but one cannot see into the darkness when bathed in the light, only when standing in shadow looking toward a shaft of it. I recoil from the looming shade, its dispassionate maw. I pray to again witness the break of day when hope rushes and fear recedes. Genesis of Edge. Mm. That must have been quite the experience. It was. I mean, I'm married to an artist. Uh, her father was an artist. Uh, kids who are now artists. Um, I've really enjoyed painting over the years, painters, uh, figurative and abstract. But I have to say that that is probably the strongest experience I've had, possibly. Certainly strong enough to inspire uh, a piece of writing on yeah. it. Um, yeah. It was shocking really good great yeah um darkness this one you know um in my book the second innocence um it's really about the death of my parents um although it has a lot of ekphrastic poems in it including that last one but you know a different kind of darkness i guess um Euphoria in Ohio. Driving home to New York from the headwaters of the Mississippi after my father's funeral, I've spent three weeks handling his life and after it. I'm in his car with the last of his stuff. It's raining like hissing, screeching yowls and guttural frothing roughs. For miles and hours in this deluge, I'm behind an F-350 truck pulling a long, empty trailer. It's nearly all I can see. I'm following his lead at 75 miles per hour. I'm playing country music and we're passing everyone. It was overcast fog when I left Minnesota yesterday. The same through Wisconsin. Nightfall through Illinois. It's been raining since I woke up in Indiana. Now, somewhere in the middle of Ohio, in the middle of the day, the rain breaks. The road is high on a plateau, high for Ohio, and overhead the darkest cloud I've ever seen, like the sky was turned off. Oak leaves float by like damaged butterflies. I've made this drive a dozen times and nothing looks familiar. I sit up straight. Suddenly I find myself happy to be here, right here in Ohio. I don't know why. My father is dead. The sky is ominous. 
and the music is about dying young in prison. My friend, the F-350, is slowed slightly. I pull out, pass him on the left. He pulls in behind me. Now I'm going to take us through the rest of this storm, the rest of this state, and the next, all the way to the Atlantic and the end of life if I have to. I feel that good. Of that, I am confident. Wow. Quite a car ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A car caravan, I guess. Yeah. A friend of mine, a recording engineer, musician in Minnesota, made me a mix for that ride uh, on a disc. Um, this is in the aughts. Um, and I just found it recently um, and pulled it out. And it's it was perfect. Perfect with the rain. Perfect with, you know driving my dad's car and his stuff after putting them in the ground and headed home, got me through it. And this next one has some light in it also kind of, you know, uh, the other the other part of this a few years after my father, skylights. On a walkway over the bustle, she glimmered in the light of the airport atrium wearing a long overcoat open to a white blouse and tan slacks. She had a look of 1959 lipstick and coiffed hair, but still look like I knew her in 2010, only a glow, like a silver nitrate Monet. Mom, I called, and she smiled, meeting my eyes. I had not seen her since she passed from this world. My insides were floating, seeing her healthy and happy to be traveling. I knew she played piano and loved to sing. I fumbled with luggage, not sure whose. We hugged. I recalled later, maybe simply a hope. To give my young, not yet a mother, mother, a fond greeting before she sets out to fly toward her future, where she becomes a nurse, meets her husband, where I will then come into being and farewells will be afterthoughts with no finality. Hmm. Someone requested that you read the dad poem again, if that's not too much. Oh, sure. <clears throat> Euphoria in Ohio. Well, actually, I literally jotted this down in the car at 75 miles an hour in a tiny notebook. <laughs> Wait, you were driving or you were a passenger? Yeah, I was no, I was driving. Uh, it was like, oh, it, it was one it's one of those poems that just <clears throat> is it's coming to you and you better get it or you're gonna lose it. And you know, a little hard to read because I was driving safely. But anyway, euphoria yeah, I, say, I, could, I couldn't do that. I would have crashed into a tree or something or yeah. You know, maybe I could do it at that point, but now I wouldn't even try it, you know. Um, somehow it was easier, though, than trying to text, write it down on my phone, for sure. Well, yeah, you could. Now you can talk into your phone. You, yeah. The AI you can go. take care of it. Yeah. Yeah. Euphoria in Ohio. Driving home to New York from the headwaters of the Mississippi after my father's funeral. I've spent three weeks handling his life and after it. I'm in his car with the last of his stuff. It's raining like hissing, screeching meows and guttural frothing roughs. For miles and hours in this deluge, I'm behind an F-350 truck pulling a long empty trailer. It's nearly all I can see. I'm following his lead at 75 miles per hour. I'm playing country music and we're passing everybody. It was overcast, fog, when I left Minnesota yesterday. The same through Wisconsin. Nightfall through Illinois. It's been raining since I woke up in Indiana. Now, somewhere in the middle of Ohio, in the middle of the day, the rain breaks. The road is high on a plateau, high for Ohio. And overhead, the darkest cloud I've ever seen, like the sky was turned off. 
Oak leaves float by like damaged butterflies. I've made this drive a dozen, a dozen times and nothing looks familiar. I sit up straight. Suddenly I find myself happy to be here, right here in Ohio. I don't know why. My father is dead. The sky is ominous and the music is about dying young in prison. My friend, the F-350, has slowed slightly. <clears throat> I pull out, pass him on the left. He pulls in behind me. Now I'm going to take us through the rest of this storm, the rest of this state, and the next, all the way to the Atlantic and the end of life if I have to. I feel that good. Of that, I am confident. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Thank you. Let's see. All right. Now, kind of a little bit. Let's see what else I got out of here. Um, yeah, I don't need that one or that one. Um, here's, here's another one kind of out of the darkness. I guess this is more speaks to the... <clears throat> Tries to anyway, to the interior darkness. Astonishment. Only we can burn our own hearts at the proper temperature. A requirement of transgressions against our individual consciousness. Yet it is human nature to act against our will, our iron discipline, our firm personal beliefs even when we know. There is a weakness not composed of character, but built into the flesh that desires sensation when face to face with aging and death. Hmm. Yeah, Maybe, very nice, very nice. Thanks, Poem to give yourself a little bit of a break. Um, <laughs> uh, well, let's do this. We have a couple breaks here in the show. Sure. Why don't we take a little break right now? And uh, I think Timothy, Beth, a few of you are new. <clears throat> we take a little five minute break for the audience to ask questions, make comments. Amanda uh, is getting ready for when I say, don't let the poet off easy. This is your time to make the poet cry. Harry, I hope you're ready for next week. Um, and obviously, I'm going to have to really rev myself up for your reading next week. So, uh, no, it's a good time for people, for poets to interact with our audience. So, anybody yeah. have any comments? Maria, I know you've put a lot of comments in the chat. So, if you want to, anybody uh, unmute just, and just, just um, go no, for I just, it. I just highlighted a couple of lines that I liked. That's all. Yeah. I did notice that that poem did go from the singular first person I to we at one moment. Uh, it's, almost, uh, it's almost like you don't even notice it. The uh, uh, euphoria in Ohio? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, I think in that, I was really... Um, well, you know, it was the relationship to the other driver, the F-350, you know, um, uh, I guess it gets people upset, right? And, you know, I guess in there too, uh, in terms of the book, you know, probably referring maybe a little bit to the family, you know? Yeah, I thought you were kind of referring to your father because I'm in yeah. the car and it's we all of a sudden. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, it's, you know, it's a spooky, you know, they like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Guy, I think the thing I like is, you know, they all have a personal connection, whether it's the Rothko viewing, you know, your dad uh, seeing your mom in the afterlife. Uh, there's there's always a personal connection. And, you know, I like that. It, it, to me, it's a little bit more impactful for me anyway. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's interesting because I, I just finished a a new full-length manuscript and 
it's a lot of nature poems. I'm going to read some, you know, from there. Um, but I tried, I tried to take myself out of a lot of those. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting. After I was done, I was looking at. It, I was like, oh, there's not a lot of emotion in it. Um, and I, I realized about the poems like I just read out of this book, you know, dealing with the death of your parents um, and other things, it's, it was like baked, it was already, you know, it was baked into the subject matter, really. Um, there's a poem in there about actually not having a dream about my father. Um, well, I finally do, that's what sparked that particular poem. But in it, I note that it, it, it you know, what I expect, I expected that. You know, my father passed away first. I thought, oh, you know, he's like in Shakespeare. He's going to come to me in a dream and give me some sage wisdom. And there was just nothing. It was just gone, you know. No more phone calls, no more, you know, no dreams, no nothing, just stuff. So, yeah, that, uh, you know, the personal connection, you know. And like, yeah, me standing in front of that huge Rothko painting, you know, and just being overwhelmed by it so just share with us a bit so you gravitated for at least part of your writing to nature poems what was the inspiration for that uh i think well i was born and raised just outside minneapolis but my favorite times in life were going to my grandparents resort visiting my uncle out on his farm I always wanted to live in the country when my wife and I met and you know she was from New York City um, and always wanted to live in the country so that was one of the things that brought us together and then we were here we moved here to upstate New York after living in a few other places and I just was like wow uh, you know people talk about writing about place I had a place. We moved here and we we made a home. I I think when we moved here, we didn't think we didn't know how long we'd be here. We still felt fluid, like oh maybe we'll move back to Min the Midwest or you know we'd spend time in Oregon or whatever. And we just here and it was just how is this part of my life? I wanted to reflect the life that I chose and wanted and actually had ended up living. You know, just simple observations. So that manuscript, every poem in it basically happens in my yard more or less um mm. unstated but uh it you know uh it was just looking around and wanting to to make note plus you know uh, that nature nature is one of the first influences in my life i think you know like nature and music and films and then when I was older, books, and then, uh, you know, those were the things that I found or that were out in the world outside myself that spoke to me outside of my the circumstances and of my birth and my parents and where they lived and their choices they made, which affected where I lived and all that, just what spoke to me in the world, nature was pretty strong. Yeah, and I think you're the second or third person recently who's talked about poems from their yard huh really whatever, whatever that little environment is around your house is a hotbed of poetry because there's all sorts of i don't know worms and birds and oh. yeah, i don't know there's a there, yeah. there's more going on in your yard than there is on your writing tablet I absolutely think. i remember in grade school they showed this film nature's half acre probably somebody's probably put it on youtube i haven't thought about it you know when i was in grade school they you know, showed a 16 millimeter film. Um, and that was fascinating. It was literally about the, the world right under your feet. And uh, there's always something going on there. And we, you know, our fortune, we have a nice, you know, quiet place uh, on the side of Overlook Mountain uh, in the Catskills. And, you know, these classic Chinese poets, you know, you know, from dating back, it's, I tried to stick a little bit to that imagist ideal a little bit in it. Um, that was a little bit of an impetus and, and, but with the gentleness of James Wright, something like that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, literally. And it wasn't pan, this was prior to the pandemic. It wasn't, it wasn't, oh, I'm stuck at home induced. It was just, 
walking out your front door and trying not to just take what you see for granted, you know, yeah. no matter what it is. Yeah, the, the thing about nature, too, is it's always moving. It's always changing. Yeah. <clears throat> and if you stand still, you can see it, you know. Yeah, you know, I, I picked out a poem. Well, maybe maybe I'll read that since you said that, Tim. Thank you. Um, that's just about that. But yeah, literally, if you look down under your feet, especially now, everything's waking up. Mm -hmm. Something's moving. Something's happening, you know. Yeah. Pretty Great. neat. Tough to yeah, see it taken yeah. apart or, you know, destroyed, mm -hmm. too. Great. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, oh, maybe I'll read that. Maybe I'll read, as long as I mention that. I, I don't know if I marked that one or not in here. Um, well, this, let me read this one. Just talking about. There was a, uh, a house being built on a ledge up above us. And it kind of inspired this poem. Um, Farms face the rising sun. It looks like just a few trees cleared for a driveway. But beyond the hill, there are acres of cornfields being stripped, paving the way for some type of center. Here, in the middle of nowhere asphalt, soil is encased. The roasted chickens are full of fat. The pig skin is crispy. The workers must be fed. Atop the scaffolding, one can see over the rises in the land to the homes nestled with their backs to the development. The man in charge is excited about his endeavor, sees comfort, the black tar, concrete and steel girders a cathedral of the new plan for people to gather for some purpose, not to work the land, but to view its beauty from inside its destruction. Hmm. That might be one, of, actually that might be the most overt political poem that I've written. Um, uh, it's just hard. It's hard, you know. I remember when we lived, my wife and I lived in Oregon, and there'd be the trees are just magnificent there. And there'd be clear cut sections, but they'd leave like just a, a thin strand along the road. So you're driving along, it looks nice with these trees. But if you look through the trees, you can see like mountainsides, you know, hillsides completely cleared. Hmm. Um, this is a poem I thought of when Timothy mentioned the uh, stillness. It's called, There Is No Stillness. Under a clear sky of forgotten stars, I hear approaching skeins of geese echo off buildings in the night. A little parking lot up on a rise. I stop walking. Three Vs flying so low the town, the lights of town, give their bellies and underwings just enough shine to be seen. A constellation on the move from southern skies, the dark matter of the universe so dense at their backs. Hmm. That was a neat thing to see. That one actually didn't take place in my yard. <laughs> But you know, we got to make fit. sure we know what's in the yard and what's outside the yard. For yeah, I needed fifty poems. So that one fit the theme of nature, so it, it went in. Um, you know, I realized in putting together some uh, of these poems that a lot of them happen on the edge. You know, I was thinking about the light and the dark, and how you know the hour of before sunrise and the hour before sunset is, you know, that uh, the twilight and the dusk or the twilight and the dawn. Um, it's called magic hour when you're making movies because of the light. And I think in a lot of, I think it's literally magic hour, like things have a fluidity during that time. Um, 
So I noticed that a lot of my poems take place on that edge, including that Rothko poem. It's about the, the edge of light and darkness. Um, here's one that speaks to that. A glow in the window. The blue night's last claws squeak down the glass. Darkness recedes like waves from shore. Slow reveal of today's coastline. Trees in silhouette against crusted snow. Pink and orange light edge the lip of sky. The stars, small crustaceans that must bury themselves until the tide of night returns. Um, well, these nature ones are definitely a lot shorter. Yeah, yeah, no, they're, uh, that is definitely an imagist poem um, right there. And that's all it took. Speaking of that, well, some of the older ones are longer. Yeah. I always wanted to write poems that were very short and concise, but it took, you know, those 20 years to get to that point um, before I could do it, you know. Um, here's another one that's, you know, about that difference between certain light. It's called seeing. The nearly full moon is setting behind the mountain. From the stoop, I see a white wolf staring at me from the wood's edge. Fur rippling in the slight breeze. Frightened, I freeze near the door. Sunrise breaks the silver horizon. Through the sway of hemlock branches, I see the wolf has become snow packed into the crotch of two oak trees. I laugh, moonlight and sunlight at play in the mountains of March. Mm, fun. A little bit of humor there. Um, you know, I spoke of interior darkness um, as being one of the darknesses. This poem speaks to that. It's called Owls Are Monkeys of the North. I used to hear voices, but thought it was chatter of a loose mind or a high I sometimes found myself on. The screeching night, mosquito netting, a thin veil like drum skin sounding words I ignored. I was a fool wanting to hinge my mind on this world as if it meant keeping sane. Now I miss those voices Wish I had listened closely and written crows cawing at 2.30 a.m. Once in a while, I still hear my name shouted from the in-between. I don't know who is speaking, so near my ear and calling from a great distance. Hmm. Well, there are a lot of lines that people like. Soil is encased tide of night from the last poem oh and then moonlight and sunlighted play so this this uh there's a lot of things that people are liking little snippets of the poem oh good thank you sorry I, i'm not paying attention to that so thank you john and thank you everyone for commenting this one this one is a is a pandemic poem i mean this is fantastic being able to be on here have people who live in different areas be able to tune in the whole, you know, a lot of readings didn't survive the pandemic. Some moved and created space online, which is great. And others just faded away. So. Guy, the key is we have no budget. Yeah. Well, that, you know, <laughs> we have no, I know Amanda is going to gift us some money or Perry uh, from the proceeds of their book, but we have no budget, so we don't have any financial concerns. Maybe next year we will, but right now we're we're yeah. we're just running. We're running on uh, pandemic fumes. So, well, I really appreciate it. But this is a poem about that, you know, that existence. It's called existence. I am speaking on a late night digital stream from the middle of somewhere only I know. I see people large as thumbnails 
hear them broadcasting from their own nowhere I know. Same, same. We are all echoes. Who is the silent person on the wall with the spider finger and toe tips? They listen. How the human voice sounds in a room, disembodied in the presence of oneself speaking at a screen. The blue ocean of light flickers in the eyes of the empty. Hmm. Um, nice. Yeah, just just a weird weird experience. Um, Here's one that speaks to the darkness. Uh, I imagine this is is almost like a diorama you'd come across in the natural in the uh, Museum of Natural History or something. It's called In the Museum of Night. People yelling outdoors sound like dogs barking in the distance. A great growling gnash, teeth meant to maim. No leashes hold tongues. Fences are useless. One hopes there is no bite. Fighting in the night has a frequency running undercurrent. Terror. Threats burn images in the dark. Sheer force of heated throats. Anger pleads for more pain. Desires unfulfilled. People shouting tell everyone clearly what they don't understand themselves. Farther away, their howls disappear, fall off the horizon and become darkness. The kennel dogs continue to bark for anyone willing to listen. So is it easier for you to write poems with a darkness angle or a darkness going into light angle? I'm just trying to figure out, you know, a lot of them seem to touch on the dark side, which is good, I, I listen. I think the dark side is where emotions are kind of stirred up at times. So, well, that's 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 interesting to hear you say that because um, speaking to that newer collection, I realized I had to put I had to put some dark into it. I felt I felt it was too there was too much light, too much not kumbia, but just you know I, I don't know. It didn't have an there was no edge in it, in a sense, like emotional edge, maybe. I don't know. And that was one of the pieces that I was borderline to include or not. And I put that in there as a longer one about um, war being on the horizon and a few others. And I think it's there. My tendency is to move towards the light. Um, but yes, I think I do want to express some of that darkness as well. Let me tell you like a 10 second humor thing. So sure. one of my neighbors, along with 40,000 other people in Maine, which is totally nuts, were driving north to see the eclipse. Yeah. Literally, it was like it was worse than July 4th around here. So I said to my friend, have fun eclipsing and don't listen to Blinded by the Light on the way up. <laughs> Blinded by, you know, that's all okay. it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah it was like. Yeah, he's like laughing. Yeah, like, okay, okay, I'm good now. That's funny. We avoided the traffic, but then we missed the eclipse because a big dark cloud moved in just when it was going to totality. It was still pretty cool, but uh, yeah, that's funny. Um, I'm probably running out of time to read everything here I have. Here's well, we got something... 15. We're going to have a few more poems. Why don't we do this? Why don't we take another little couple minute break for people with comments or questions, and then you can finish out with some poems. Okay, sounds good. Anybody? Uh, Katie, this is our, your time, as I said before. Don't let the poet off easy. Uh, you know, we want to see him sweat. He's a little too calm right now. <laughs> uh, he's, uh, he's in the light. We got to push him back into the darkness. Yeah, I, I tend to egg on the crowd. That's what I try to do, but... Guy, it doesn't work. I can't get them going. Yeah. Well, there's a few no shows here. I see that that definitely would have taken the bait on that. <laughs> Maybe it's good they didn't show up. <laughs> Anybody have some questions or comments? Just stuff. unmute yourself and. I was just going to say that earlier you had mentioned um, trying to write about uh, when things are backlit, you know, 
And, yeah. But you, you did have that in one of your poems that you read, that you shared with us, an image that... I did, I did. Yeah, I forgot that I that was that. in there. I went, oh yeah, that's right. I put this in a poem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there was one of those things like I couldn't write a poem about it, but you know, looking, you know, I had to sneak it in somewhere. Right. It was just like one of those moments where I went like, oh duh, I'm just standing out in my yard and going, this is how it works, you know, <laughs> walking back and forth from my, you know, porch light into the woods and back, you know. Um so that's what I'm doing. That, that's why I moved to the country. So I could be weird out in the woods walking around. <laughs> you know, I'm the kind of guy who like, I spent one afternoon watching ants move their nest from one part of the yard, all like 50 yards away to another part. And it was fascinating. They didn't go any further apart than like, that was really more like 18 inches, you know, maybe two feet. And just the way it moved and the ants are moving eggs and the ones are coming back to get more stuff and bring it you know that was that was beautiful to me i i couldn't write about i i didn't have a way i don't know for me two things need to come together to make a poem like that experience of the ants and then something else i don't know maybe the story about my wife and i moving so, something two things need to come together to hopefully form a synthesis and you know but anyway, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Thanks. Anybody else? Maria? Yeah, I, I, I want to say so many, so many of your poems will have uh, a, a re reference to light, like the the uh, the image of those the bellies of those geese being lit by the the town lights. Um, those things sort of grab my attention uh, when you when when they come up and. Uh, and it, and in a dark poem, you know, you, you you're contrasting those. You often have a light, a light reference of some kind or color or something, and then, and then um, that that will contrast with the dark. So I, I, I like I like that very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that poem was right out of New Paltz, actually. Uh, oh um, yeah, we we had geese in the cornfield down here. Yeah. No, I heard him coming and looked, and it's like they were way up there. I don't, you know, but it was just enough you could see him. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a couple more poems to read. They're all about what you just mentioned. Go we for it. Read them. Uh, <clears throat> a short one, then kind of a longer one. So this one I like because it has the edge right in there, literally. Um, it's a prose poem. A low fuchsia morning. I pour the dark coffee into my dark mug by the white of the moon streaming through the west window of the sun porch. Something which usually requires artificial light to prevent a burnt hand and to leave the right amount of space for milk. I see Castor and Pollux like two small eyes above the waning open mouth which shines a bright set of teeth. Opposite, out the east window, a low fuchsia morning begins to rise, but Venus strong in the band of palest blue opening above the horizon. It's so nice. I pause before going to my office, which faces north with its one small window. I stand in the dark house, transfixed by light expanding outside. Tree bark gains definition as darkness diminishes. I step to the sliding door facing south and lean my forehead against the cold glass. I can be seen here. A different sky in each periphery of sight. I beg myself, stop fretting about death. Mm. Yeah, I think as you get older, that that pops in your mind a lot more. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think, <laughs> I think the poem is giving you orders. Okay, enough about death. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> it is amazing how the words kind of jump out sometimes and, uh, you know, basically give you some direction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember that, that day distinctly. Just right, felt like I was right on the edge, you know, dark and night and the light rising. Here I am and I don't know, maybe that's what made me death pop into my mind. So I'm going to read this last 
Well, I mean, I'll read another one if there's time. Yeah. It's a little bit longer. Yeah, go ahead. Just one. Uh, well, I was a top finalist out of, there was five winners, uh, international contest. It was fifth, but that's okay. Um, and it speaks to all of this. There was a thing, there's a thing. I, I mean, I was the kind of person, I think even my earliest remember, mem memory from when I was three was about the light on this mountain in California. My parents were on a trip. But I was the kind of kid in like third grade who'd see the slant of light across the empty playground and just be profoundly sad. And there's been a quality of light all my life that I don't know how else to explain it, that it almost seems like space and time is fluid and the motion is, I don't know, it's like an ocean. So I talk about it in this poem called What Memories Are Carried in Light. In poems, the light Pablo Neruda saw adrift in the Chile Chilean Andes. Sea and sun while bell bells rang an ocean breeze. Jack Gilbert's Greek sun above the blue Aegean hammering rock and weed followed by brilliant white truest under moonlight. Jane Kenyon's golden dust sparkle of late day hay light. We shape light, mental constructions never before imagined. Even in sleep, we play cinemas of apocalypse and passion churned from the crevasse of our unconscious inside an exploded universe. Music creates light in the dark. I see vast across vast stretches of Canadian plains swept with brushes of broken clouds that pass onward, sweep the steppes of Tibet and sift through snowy trees in far Northern Russia. All over the world, light attaching to everything that can hold, traveling from everything that reflects. Unending fathoms which light can travel, passing to the center of the mind, not in the middle of our heads, the deeper heart which doesn't beat in our chests. A quality of light all my life, a vision, Mediterranean sun illuminating stone architecture like impressionist paintings. But it's both there and not there. A quality inside the tonality. Turning my vision inside out, it is an image neither dream nor memory, but also a feeling more abstract, like a future past, the light of Antibe Nicholas Dastil cut onto canvas, non-figurative impasto. All Edward Hopper wanted to paint was sunlight on the side of a house. That light is outside my life. I've seen Calif Southern California beach light after rainfall, San Francisco's autumn sea light, a soft gray hush on Manhattan streets, morning orange New Mexico desert, Midwest late afternoon slant across cornfields, windbreaks of the prairie, barn swallows at dusk, hollyhocks in the farmyard, red wing blackbirds in the marshes. Oregon's Pacific light looked closest to my vision, sun below the coastal range, Colossal trees caught the gold shine in the high branches, and it glowed rose pink among the snow tops of the Cascades. As evening descended, ocean mist and thin haze, that light felt distant from my life. Catskill Mountains, bluestone origins from under the sea, lights witness longer than ancient stories have told. Sunlight comes yellow through the forest and falls into the lap of my yard. Summer, 6 p.m., the entire spectrum falling everywhere. Flora and fauna of the wood wave and scramble, gather up the day's diminishing light. It shifts, fractions of nanoseconds. We perceive the slow subtleties. Our eyes rise, lower, blink, and we stretch the leaf of our skin up and outward. But it's late August, my feet high in the dunes of the Cape, cool, dry sand, sundown, glowing sea sky twilight.
a perfect calmness, well flukes in the distance. Laughter, it's the most beautiful I've ever felt. But more, the children, the color of bronze, shine a light no tenderness could ever hold. For our hands are too much sinew. Tendons require tension from which light travels free as we leap. Earth continues falling through space. Gravity pulls at our hearts, and we are left with a gentleness beyond our body's possibility. Hmm. And that is my big painting, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> I think you I think there is a yeah, it was a almost like a movie of light from all sorts of different places. It was uh yeah, I marvel at the the late afternoon light here that, that goes on to the houses. We we have some amazing sunsets in mid coast Maine and uh yeah, I always think the, the one hour before sunset yeah. is fantastic. It is I always try to spend uh some time outside during that time. I'm an early riser too, so I, I do like that. I like to rise in the dark. I like to look at the stars actually early in the morning, and then catch that that change over, you know. But at evening, it's just like a I don't know. It's like a good feeling in your in your stomach or something. Seeing that light, that late day light in the sky. Well, good. Yeah. Well, We're thank you. Just about the end of our hour, so. Thank you for I got more if anybody wants to to hear more. I don't even know what I would read. <clears throat> oh, I could read Night Owl. I could read a poem about you that. Got, you have uh, you have two minutes, so you can Yeah, I can do that. Two minutes before the uh, bell sound. No, there's no bell. Right? Terry, we need a bell. We don't have a bell. I was gonna throw my website up into the chat, but it's being worked on right now. It's still up, but I see most of these people know me, so they could they can find it. Guy Edwin Reed.com. Edwin. I'll read this one. This is for Donald Lev, who is a poet who is I loved. It's called Night Owl. It's currently on published online at lightwoodpress.com. Night Owl. I love to put the stars to bed like family. Usually an early morning in the late dark when no clouds hover between the lights. At the zenith, the near future, stars of next month's primetime evening hours. The stars who have had all night in our sky tuck into the western horizon. I nod a drowsy good night as they're off to rise in the dusk of another's east, where no someone may or may not wonder about yesterday's dawn as he, she, they bid Serenara to the sun. This close star always setting and starting the day on opposite sides as we continue to spin in orbit and I close my eyes to sleep. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you for uh, a trip around the light universe with a few dances with the darkness. So... Yeah, I think you're the first one that's really uh, embellished the light in the dark. Like everyone I said, that else, was right in my wheel. With the sparks and moves on. Yeah, that was in my wheelhouse for sure when I saw. Yeah, that. I was, was going like, to say oh, we hit yeah. uh, Amanda. We hit. We hit. Uh, I don't know. Now a lithium deposit used to be gold. Now it's lithium. We hit a lithium deposit with the darkness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Listen. Very good, everyone. Thanks for thanks for joining, and uh, you know. Hopefully we'll see you next week.